I would like to take a minute to talk about this week's sponsor, Upside. Upside is an amazing free application that lets you earn cash back just for purchasing the things that you already do on a weekly basis, like gas or groceries. It's super simple to use and you'll quickly notice the benefits. My only regret is not downloading Upside sooner. Now with every purchase that I make, I'm earning cash back thanks to Upside. I may have mentioned this before, but there's an awesome little restaurant right by my house and with the Upside app, I'm getting 7% cash back every time that I eat there. Not only is the food delicious, but I feel great about saving some money in the process. And to get started, download the free Upside app and use my promo code MRCREEPS and get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Next, claim an offer for whatever you're buying on Upside. Check in at the business, pay as usual with a credit or debit card and get paid. In comparison to credit card rewards or loyalty programs, you can earn three times more cash back with Upside. Upside users are earning more than a million dollars every week. That's probably why they have a 4.8 star rating in the App Store. Download the free Upside app and use promo code MRCREEPS to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. That's $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more using promo code Mr. Krebs. I must be going crazy. I can see a town that doesn't exist. My name is Samuel Baker. I'm a Yellowstone National Park Ranger and I need some advice. I've spent my entire career fighting wildfires for the National Park Service. And after two decades in the field, I thought that I had seen everything. Then about four hours ago, an entire town just appeared in the middle of Yellowstone National Park. And the other ranger and I are the only ones who've been in it. We're not alone, however, as you might expect from something appearing out of nowhere inside one of America's most famous parks. The town is home to many people, some of whom who have been there for years. They all seem perfectly normal, but they aren't aware that they live inside a national park. My partner Thomas was the first to notice the town. He had driven into the valley a few hours before dawn one morning and saw a brand new sign on the road. Welcome to Hungry Horse, it read. When he drove past the next bend in the road, he saw the motel. That's when he turned around to come and get me. The two of us had driven up the valley together in our trusty old Chevy Blazer and taken the long way around because we didn't want to pass through the town until we were sure of what it was. We parked at the base of the mountain and hiked up. We walked across the railroad tracks and passed a small gas station with a lone oil drum full of diesel fuel and another filled with water. The street was lined with old cars, some of which looked like they had been there for a while others which had probably just arrived that morning. Hungry Horace was in a ghost town, or even abandoned. It was thriving. Thomas and I entered the town cautiously, because despite appearances, this place could be dangerous. While we didn't run into any trouble, we did notice that everything seemed indifferent to the fact that they just appeared out of nowhere. Most of them ignored us completely, Although a few gave us strange looks. Some of these people look familiar, I said, looking over at Thomas and he nodded. Yeah, I know what you mean, Sam. I recognized a couple people in the diner too. It's weird. It's weird. Those words echoed in my head as I watched a man carrying a bucket walk down the sidewalk. It's weird. I repeated silently to myself. My eyes followed his movements. The man carried himself with confidence and purpose, but he never looked up at where he was walking. Instead, he stared straight ahead and continued forward without looking back once. He disappeared around the corner of a building, and I noticed another person staring directly at me. He was tall and thin, wearing a black hiking jacket. His face was pale and he was bald. He was standing in the doorway of a small coffee shop. He reminded me of the missing hiker that we had searched for last week. 
That's when I realized why I recognized some of the people here. They are all people who have vanished from national parks. That's how we found out that almost every single person in Hungry Horse had been reported missing from national parks. We spoke to everyone we could find. Some refused to talk. Others were friendly enough. But none of them knew anything about why they were there. As far as they were concerned, they lived in Hungry Horse, Montana. They weren't sure exactly when they had arrived there. A lot of them couldn't remember much before arriving in Hungry Horse. They also told us that they had been here for years. Many of them had been born and raised in the town and believed it was the real deal. They all knew the townsfolk by name and went to school with them. One woman, an older lady named Irene, told us that she had no idea that she had been reported missing. She worked at the local hardware store and had been living in Hungry Horse for more than 45 years. What about your husband? I asked, do you have children, grandchildren? She shook her head. No, I've never married. How do you feel about being here? Do you miss anywhere else? Your family, maybe. Again, she shook her head. Not really. This is my home. As far as she knew, this was the only home she had ever known. I tried to ask if she missed her family, but she only smiled and told me that. Her family was right here in Hungry Horse, Montana. We thanked her and left the hardware store. Hopping back into our park ranger truck and we drove deeper into the town. I really don't like this, Sammy, Thomas said. I've had a feeling of being watched ever since we entered town. I looked over at him. He was staring at a man standing by a large semi-trailer outside of the diner. The man was holding a jug of milk. I couldn't about think of the hiker that we had found dead last week. Sam, are you listening to me? I snapped back to reality and I looked at my partner. Thomas said I started quivering in fear. Sorry, what'd you say? I said that I think we should leave. I don't want to be here anymore. I looked around the town. There were so many people here, so many people who shouldn't be here. All of them were perfectly normal. Some of them even knew each other. How could there be so many people in a town that doesn't exist? I agree. Uh, let's go, I said. We drove away from the town and back to the ranger cabin. Thomas was still shaking. I'm going to call this in, he said. This whole thing is nuts, but we better document it anyway. I mean, how could an entire town full of missing people just appear in the middle of Yellowstone. I nodded. Okay, I'll be in the cabin. I think I need some time to process all this. I sat down on the couch and I closed my eyes. It all felt unreal. I kept thinking about the hiker that we had found out in the woods last week. He had died while out on a hike in the wilderness. He had been alone and confused. But I just saw him alive and well, in a town that doesn't exist. I opened my eyes and looked around. I took in a deep breath and I let it out. It smelled like wood smoke and pine. I stood up and I started pacing the room. What am I supposed to make of all this? I asked myself. Is it some kind of sick joke? Did the government put a town in Yellowstone for some reason? What if it's not a town? Maybe it's a cover-up for something worse. I thought before zoning out. There was a knock on the door. It startled me out of my daydream. Uh, come in, I yelled. Two men came inside, both dressed in black suits. Are you the one in charge here? One of them asked. I looked at him and nodded. The guy was wearing a badge on his chest and a gun on his hip. He looked like an FBI agent. I'm about to go and talk to them, and I don't know if they'll believe me. What do I do? First off, let me clarify some things from my earlier update. I was a wildland firefighter up until a year ago when I decided that I needed a change of pace. And they weren't FBI agents. They said they were from a private company that deals with the otherworldly. I sat in front of the two men, waiting for them to start asking questions. So, do you know why I've been assigned to this case? 
the taller of the two said. You're the only one in the park who knows anything about this. I nodded. Thomas also knows, but I think you guys already know that. It's pretty weird. The town you described doesn't exist. Not according to the GPS and the satellite data. Yes, it does. I answered, surprised. It's a lie, the second man said. He had short blonde hair and wore glasses. We checked every single point on the map, every house, every business. There is nothing there. No way. You can't tell me you've been everywhere in the park and haven't noticed it. I said angrily. When I first came to the park, I saw the sign for Hungry Horse. I thought that it was a joke at first, but then I saw the motel, the gas station, the diner, the hardware store, and I saw the people inside of them. The man with the glasses nodded slowly. But we've checked every inch of the surrounding area. We've looked at aerial photos, satellite images. We've even flown over the valley with a helicopter. Well, maybe you should have a look again. Maybe you missed something. I said defiantly. We did. There's nothing there. It's not possible. Do I have to show you where it is myself then? I asked. Both men traded glances, and then the shorter one nodded. Very well. If you're so sure you've seen something unusual, we'll take you there. Thank you, I said. I got out of my chair and followed the two men out of the cabin. They were in their early fifties, both with short hair and blue eyes. They were talking quietly to each other as I followed them out of the cabin to their unmarked car. Now, the man with the glasses said, if you could just lead us to your town. Sure, I replied. We drove deeper into the park. Our vehicle was equipped with a topographical GPS system, which made it easy to navigate through the rugged terrain. After an hour of driving, we came to a hill overlooking a wide valley. We passed the sign for Hungry Horace. Did you see the sign? I yelled. The men just looked at each other. I'm sorry, what? The shorter one asked. There's a sign here, it says Hungry Horace, right? The man shook his head. I don't see anything. He pulled off the road and stopped right before the sign. He turned off the engine and looked at me. Maybe we should get out and look again, he suggested. I agreed and got out of the car and ran over to the sign. It's right here, I shouted. He walked up behind me and looked over my shoulder. What the heck is this? It's a sign. It says Hungry Horse, I yelled. He looked at me and glared. I grabbed his arm and pulled him over to where I could see the sign. Can't you read? He pulled away and rolled his eyes. Read what? It says Hungry Horace, I yelled. What are you talking about? He yelled back. I pointed at the sign. Look, the name of the town. And the man sighed. There's no sign there. I got angry and was about to yell at the agent when, out of the corner of my eye, I saw someone walking towards us from out of the woods in the direction of the town. It was Irene, the older woman from the hardware store. My eyes lit up and I pointed at her. Irene, I yelled excitedly. The agent turned to face the old woman. His eyes widened in surprise and he opened his mouth to say something. But before he could, Irene hit him and sent him flying into a tree. Well, you shouldn't have come back, Ranger, she hissed. With lightning speed, she charged the agent with the glasses. Run, I yelled and jumped into the car. But it was too late for the agent. Irene had already snapped his neck. I frantically ran back to the unmarked car and tried to start it. The engine sputtered and failed to turn over. Irene stood directly in front of me, blocking my path back to the cabin. What the heck are you? I yelled. You should have never come here, she said. You have no idea what you're getting yourself into. What the heck is going on? I yelled. She snarled and lunged forward. Her teeth had grown sharp and she had snapped at me, but I evaded her bites and rammed my fist into her stomach. Dang it, I yelled. I grabbed her shoulders and threw her into the side of the car. She slid across the hood and fell to the ground. 
I jumped around the car and I kicked her once in the ribs. I'm gonna kill you, I said. She smiled. Oh, I've been dead for years, honey. I was about to punch her again when a hand grabbed my arm and yanked me backwards. I spun around and stared at the person who grabbed my arm. It was Thomas, my partner. He had followed the agents and I. What are you doing? I yelled. Don't be stupid. We have to get back to the cabin. I looked at him and shook my head. No, we can't run from these things, I said, flabbergasted. What the heck is wrong with you? He slapped me hard across the face. Shut up. Just shut up. I rubbed my cheek and looked at Thomas in disbelief. What are you talking about? His eyes were wide open with panic. I heard Irene starting to get up. You have to leave now. Right now. He grabbed me by the collar and pushed me into the driver's seat of the dead agent's car. Get in, he yelled, and drive. What about you? I asked. I can't fight them anymore. You know how many rangers they've taken, he said. Just get out of here. We just found out about the town yesterday. How do you know all of this? I yelled. You just found out about the town, he replied. The heck does that mean? Just go. I'll keep Irene occupied. Get back to the cabin and read my journal. I can't believe it, he nodded. I know. I pulled a 180 and sped back down the road towards the cabin. I saw Thomas jump at Irene in the rearview mirror. He looked bigger than he usually does. He was standing on top of her, pinning her arms to the ground. Screw you, Irene yelled. Thomas punched her in the face and she went limp. Stay down. The last thing I saw was Thomas running towards the town. I'm back at the cabin and I'm reading through his journal. There's so much that I never knew about him. I finished reading Thomas's journal. I can't believe that I trusted him. Thomas knew everything. He knew what the town was all along. He knew that Irene would come after me and he didn't tell me anything. I feel like such an idiot. Every single national park has one of these towns. He had been the head of a team of people called The Watchers, a branch of a company called ARC, or Anomaly Research Corporation, assigned to monitor Hungry Horse, to make sure that the people who go missing in national parks are found before the town can get to them. Jesus Christ, why didn't I figure this out sooner? Why did I trust him? Ah, stupid, stupid Sam. I read some more of his journal. It explains that the towns might be sentient and can choose who can see and interact with them. And how national parks are only founded when one of these towns blink into existence. Yellowstone is the first and has the largest town. But the towns aren't the main threat. It's what the people who get taken turn into. When they get taken, their minds are changed and become something else. Something sinister. I flip to another page and it explains that the town doesn't take everyone. Some people are harder for the town to influence and they can resist its power. These people are called Watchers. Watchers can still be taken, but it's rare. And I think Hungry Horace just took the last Watcher in Yellowstone. There's a phone number and a note written inside the front cover of the journal. It says to call the number of Thomas is missing or if he seems off and to tell the person who picks up on the other end that Thomas has been compromised. This is insane, I thought to myself. I set the journal aside and I looked out the window. The sun was setting and it cast a beautiful orange glow over the mountains. I could hear the river flowing nearby. I heard a noise outside and I turned around. A large shadow moved quickly across the trees near the cabin. I watched as it approached the edge of the woods. It was Thomas. He didn't look injured at all despite the fight with Irene. I ran to the door and locked it as soon as he had stepped onto the porch. I looked out the window at Thomas. Why aren't you injured? I asked through the window. They can't hurt me anymore, he answered. Who are they? I asked. The town, he whispered. The town, I asked. Yeah, he said. What happened to your team? He's dead. 
He's gone. Is that why you never told me about the town in the first place? I asked. Well, I didn't want to scare you. How'd you know Irene would come after me? Well, the town let me know. The town, you know what I mean. The town tells you stuff because you're a watcher. Yes, he whispered. What the heck? That's not important. Your journal didn't say the town was intelligent. It's alive. It thinks and it feels. It's a living entity. Its mind is vast and powerful. It talks to you. Yeah, sometimes. What does it say? Everything. Everything. I was dumbstruck. That's impossible. It's true. Now please, let me inside. He loudly begged. But I noticed something was off with his voice. Why do you sound different? I asked. Well, because you're making me nervous. Well, you're freaking me out. Please, let me in. I looked up at him for a few minutes without saying anything. There was something off about his face that made me curious. Something that seemed odd. Finally, I shook my head. I'm sorry, Thomas, I said. He threw his body at the door. Let me in, he shouted. Well, I can't do that, Thomas, I said calmly. I unlocked the gun locker and grabbed the only shotgun that we had. I pointed it at him and waited. Thomas stopped moving and leaned against the door. His breathing became shallow and quick. Sammy, you're my best friend, he started to say. I'm sorry, Thomas, but I can't open the door, I snarled. Stop lying, he yelled. Open the freaking door. He started throwing himself against it again. Panicking, I pushed the table and couch in front of it. Samuel, he screamed. Open this door. I just ignored him and went upstairs and laid on the bed. He kept banging on the door for about an hour. Eventually, he finally stopped, but I could still hear him yelling outside. I think that I might just call that number he wrote down in his journal. Maybe Ark will send someone to deal with Thomas. I dialed the number. It rang three times before a man picked it up and said, Hello, Thomas. I sat there silently. Hello? He asked again. It got Thomas, I yelled. Are you safe? The man asked. No, I'm not safe, I screamed. Thomas has become one of the things from Hungry Horse, and now he's here, and he's trying to break into the cabin. Uh, hold on, he said. We'll send someone out right away. Is anyone else with you? No, just me, I answered. Okay, stay put and don't let him get inside the cabin, he said, and then he hung up. I laid back down on the bed and tried to ignore the sounds coming from downstairs. I could hear Thomas pounding against the door again. I was terrified that Ark wouldn't show up soon enough. And then suddenly, I heard a car pull up outside. I jumped off the bed and rushed downstairs and looked out the window. There were men with rifles standing outside. I saw one of them run to the cabin. And the banging at the door had stopped. Thomas had noticed them. I heard Thomas roar and the sound of gunshots. I watched as the men loaded Thomas, who was still alive somehow, into the back of the van. The two men got into the van and drove off as another car pulled up to the cabin. A man in a white lab coat stepped out and walked up to the door, knocking on it. Open the door, Sam, and don't make this harder than it has to be. Who the heck are you? My name is Dr. Jade in Oxblood, he said. Well, what do you want? I demanded. I need to talk to you about Thomas. I don't have time for this, just leave me alone, I yelled at him. I heard him sigh and that's when I felt an arm grab my shoulder and something prick my neck. I started to curse and the world faded to black. I woke up on the couch about 30 minutes later. Looking around, I saw that Dr. Oxblood was sitting in a chair across from me. Now that everything has calmed down, you're going to tell me everything you know, he said. I guess I don't have a choice, guys. I'll update you all after I talk with the doctor. Let me explain what happened. Oxblood drove into the headquarters of Ark, 
And once there, Dr. Oxblood led me into his office and told me to sit down. He locked the door and sat across from me. The room was filled with bookshelves and pictures of presidents and generals from many different wars. On the walls were weapons that I didn't even recognize. So, tell me about the town, he said. What makes you think I know anything about the town? I asked. Well, I have reason to believe that you are aware of its existence, he said. Well, fine, what do you want to know? Tell me everything you know about the town. Everything? All of it. And I told him about the day that Thomas told me about the town. Our trip to Hungry Horse and how Thomas had stayed behind to fight Irene. He listened intently as I spoke. He was taking notes while I talked and occasionally he asked me a question. When I finished telling him everything that he wanted to know, he stood up and walked over to a cabinet and he opened it. He reached inside and pulled out a small silver box and placed it on his desk. What's that? I asked. It's a key, he answered. One day, you'll need it. Why would I ever need a key? I asked. You'll find out, he said. If you really want to find out what happened to your friend and figure out what the town is, you'll use the key to unlock the secrets of the town. Why should I trust you? I asked. I can't tell you that. You'll have to learn to trust me in time. He handed me the key. It was heavier than I expected it to be. I looked at it for a long moment before putting it into my pocket. What do you plan on doing with me? I asked. You're a very valuable asset to us. We want you to become the newest watcher of Yellowstone. I stared at him for a second, remembering what I had read in Thomas's journal. What is a watcher exactly? Well, it's a title given to humans who have been chosen by Ark to help protect the world from the supernatural, he said. Well, doesn't Ark already have watchers? I asked. Yes, they have many watchers, but none of them have ever entered one of the towns without changing, like you. You're the first human to enter one of the towns and return without becoming a monster, he answered. I sat there and thought about it. So if I agree to become a watcher, what are the risks for me? I asked. Well, there are no guarantees. The risk of your life, your sanity, and possibly losing your humanity are all very high. And what happens if I decline? I asked. We will kill you. He answered. I laughed. Why do you think I'll accept? I asked. And he smiled. Because you want to save your best friend Thomas and you want more answers. Are you saying that you can give me those answers? I asked. Not yet. But once you become a watcher, I'll be able to teach you everything you need to know. Well, how long until I can become a watcher? I asked, and he smiled. And you've been a watcher ever since you read that journal. I stared at him for a minute before shaking my head. You can't be serious, I exclaimed. Completely serious. I sighed. Alright, so what exactly do you expect me to do? I don't know any more about the towns than you do. I know that much. So why did you ask me here then? Well, to offer you a job. A job? Yeah, a job as a watcher. I want you to become one of us. Well, what kind of job exactly? I asked. In order to become an official watcher, you must become a member of ARC, he answered. What does that entail? I asked. You will have to sign an agreement stating that you will work for us. You will also be required to undergo training and take a test to prove yourself, he explained. Well, and what do I get in return for signing this agreement? I asked. A bigger paycheck than you've ever seen, he answered. Seriously? Yeah, the pay's pretty good, he said. But the real benefit is the knowledge that you're helping to keep the world safe from monsters, demons, and other threats to humanity. Not everyone gets that chance. Yeah, it sounds good to me, I said. Well, good, he said. Congratulations. He unlocked the door with the key and we left the room together. On the way out, a man dressed in a park ranger uniform approached me. This will be your new partner, Dr. Oxblood said. Welcome to Ark, 
he said. Do you mind if I asked your name? I asked. My name is John, he answered, and I shook his hand. Well, nice to meet you, John. Likewise. All right, well, I guess this is goodbye for now, Oxblood. I'm sure I'll be seeing you soon, I said. You better hope you do, he joked. After leaving the building, John and I got in his car and drove off. So, where are we going? I asked. Go back to your cabin, he answered. We arrived at my cabin and the sun was setting and the sky was getting dark. We got out of the car and headed towards the cabin. Once inside, I sat on the couch and I looked at John. So, what's going to happen now? I asked. Well, that depends entirely on you. What do you mean by that? I asked. John took out a bottle of whiskey and poured himself a drink. I watched as he drank most of it before answering. I intend to train you to become a watcher, but until then, you'll be living with me, he said. Living with you, I asked. For the next couple of months, I'll help you get used to being a watcher so that when it comes time to choose your own partner, you'll be able to keep them safe. You'll also start to learn things about Ark that even some of our agents don't know. Well, what kind of things? I can't really explain it to you. It will only make sense once you're fully trained. I nodded. Fine. Drink up, he said. We need to get you settled in. I laughed and poured myself some whiskey. John says that training begins in an hour. I'm going to take a nap before he trains me. I was awoken from my nap by the sound of shattering glass and John yelling for me to get my butt downstairs. I ran down and into the kitchen. What was that? It wasn't John who answered my question. Hello, Samuel. It seems I've gotten the upper hand this time. Irene said, holding John by the shoulders. She looked much younger than when I last saw her, and she was wearing a black dress, white gloves, and her hair was done up. She was beautiful and terrified at the same time. What did you do to Thomas? I asked. Oh, Thomas was a fool, Samuel. He chose to stay behind to protect you. He made his choice and my town changed him, she said. I would have killed you both if you hadn't escaped. But now you're mine again and I'm going to enjoy every minute of it. What are you talking about? What do you mean you're a town? I asked. Irene smirked, her eyes sparkling with hatred. My town is a demon. The town is a creature created by the demon king, Azazel. He built our town to serve as his prison. He puts all the monsters in it so they could one day be released upon your world. I was speechless. My mind was reeling from the news. Well, who are you? I finally managed to say. I'm the gatekeeper of the demon kingdom. I'm here to destroy the world and end life as we know it, she said. Let me go, John shouted. She slammed him against the wall and held him there with ease. You're not going anywhere until I decide otherwise, she said, smiling. Release him, I yelled. She looked at me and laughed. You don't seem to understand, Samuel. I control this place. Nobody is going to help you. She let go of John and walked towards me. You don't scare me, and I know you can't hurt me, she said. And that's when I remembered the silver key that Dr. Oxblood had given me. Where did you get that? She snarled. Wouldn't you like to know? I quipped back at her. I suddenly felt something strange. It was like my body was being pulled away from my soul. I struggled to hold on to it. What are you doing? She screeched. I tried to resist, but it was too late. My soul was gone. Give me the key, Irene screamed, running towards me. Suddenly, I was back in my body again. I was kneeling on the floor in front of Irene, holding onto my head with one hand and clutching my chest with the other. I could see everything in slow motion. I watched as Irene charged towards me, her face twisted with rage. I stood up and grabbed her by the neck, squeezing tightly. Let go of me, she screeched. I squeezed harder. I felt her throat bulge and blood began to leak out of her mouth. I threw her through the window that she had broken in through. 
I watched as she got up and glared at me before turning around and heading back towards a hungry horse. I turned around, looking over to John who was standing in the doorway, a deep gash running down the left side of his face. He smiled at me. You might not need as much training as I thought you would, he said. That was pretty impressive. I felt a surge of pride. I'll be right back, I said. Be careful, Samuel, he said. Don't go get yourself killed. I smiled. I wouldn't dream of it. I followed Irene back to her house in Hungry Horrors. I was hoping to kill her, but right as I was about to enter through a window in the basement, I heard her say, Are you idiots ready yet? We just need five more humans and I'll be powerful enough to open another gate. I want to open the next one in Canada. I backed away, looking in through a window on the bottom floor, and I saw about 20 townspeople gathered inside. That's when I turned and ran. I ran as fast as I could, dialing John's number as I crossed Hungry Horse's border back into Yellowstone. John answered his phone almost immediately. Where are you? He asked. I ignored his question and asked one of my own instead. Are there any people camping in Yellowstone tonight? I asked. I'm not sure why. Irene only needs to take five more people before she can create another town and she's got a group together to go out and find some, I said. He swore under his breath. How big is the group? About 20. All right, listen, I have a plan. We need to stop her before she can take more people. Are there any people camping close to Hungry Horace? I questioned him. Yeah, there's a bunch camping around Old Faithful, he said. How far away are we from them? I asked. Well, I don't know exactly. It's hard to tell how far away anything is in Montana at night, but they should be within half an hour or less, he answered. All right, listen, I have a plan. Can you get to the campground before midnight? Yeah, I can be there in 30 minutes, he answered. Good. Get your gear together and meet me at Glacier. Don't forget to bring your guns, I ordered. Roger that, I'll see you there, he said. I hung up the phone and stared at it for several seconds before dialing Oxblood's number. Ah, uh, Samuel. I cut him off. No time. I need you to send a team out to the campground at Glacier. I told him. Well, Alright, I'll have a team heading out there as soon as possible, he answered. I hung up the phone as I began to run faster than any human has ever run before. I thought about Irene and how close she was to opening another gate. I was filled with rage at knowing that I might die trying to stop her, but I couldn't think about that right now. I needed to focus on what I was doing. If Irene opened up another gate, who knows what will happen. The moon was slowly rising into the sky, casting long shadows across the ground. The air was cold and the temperature was dropping as I ran. I could hear the sounds of the wolves chasing their prey somewhere nearby. As I ran towards the campground near Glacier, I could smell smoke emanating from the campground. I shivered at the familiar scent and I continued to run. As I got closer to Glacier, I noticed the campground was packed full of tents and RVs. I started hearing gunshots and screams. I looked around frantically for ARC operatives, but it didn't appear that they were here yet. There was a large burning fire in the middle of the campground. It looked like somebody had set it. I kept running, weaving between the tents until I found a tent that was completely shredded on one side and engulfed in flames. There was a body inside and it was completely mangled. I could barely make out any details of the person's face. There was no way to tell much of anything from what was left of it. But whoever this person was, they definitely weren't a friend of Irene's. I looked around the campground again and saw nothing but chaos. People were screaming, crying, and running away from Irene's monsters as John fought them off. Suddenly, I heard the sound of a helicopter. I looked up at the night sky and saw an ARC helicopter swooping in. It hovered over the middle of the campground, their lights shining brightly. ARC, come on, hurry, I yelled. I was still a few hundred feet away from the fight when I saw one of those things jump onto the roof of an RV and launch itself at the helicopter. It smashed through the window and tore the pilot out of her seat. 
I watched helplessly as the helicopter careened out of control, crashing into the last section of the campground that wasn't blocked by Irene's people. The helicopter exploded, sending debris everywhere and causing panic amongst the remaining campers. I took off running, making my way towards the center of the campground where John and his men were fighting the creatures. He kept them at bay, but they were slowly overwhelming him. That's when Irene grabbed him by the throat and lifted him off the ground, her face inches from his, her long red nails glistening in the moonlight. What do you think you're doing? She growled. John struggled to speak. Why are you doing this? What do you want? He wheezed. She leaned in closer and brought her lips to John's ear. What do I want? She whispered and then pushed him back, sending him flying into the dirt. I want your world, she yelled. She pointed at John and the campers. And nothing you can do will stop me. She roared with laughter. She stepped forward and placed her foot on John's neck. Now you're going to watch as my people slaughter every single person that you were trying to protect. My vision went red and I let out the loudest, most visceral roar that I had ever heard. The fighting instantly stopped as everyone winced and covered their ears. Everyone but Irene that is. Irene had turned and snarled at me. Hey, I sneered at her. I stood in front of her, my hands balled into fists at my sides. I looked into Irene's eyes as she glared back at me with pure hatred in her own. Do you really think that you'll stand a chance against me? I'm the strongest being that you will ever have to face. You're nothing compared to what I can do. She yelled, her voice filled with venom. Watch me, I responded. I took several steps back and leaned forward letting the muscles in my legs tense up. My shoulders tightened and I could feel my back arch. I let out another primal roar as I prepared to pounce. Irene smirked, her eyes sparkling in the light of the burning fires. Go ahead, you'll never touch me, watcher, she taunted. You're far too. I didn't give her the time to finish. I sprang forward, slamming into Irene and knocking us both to the ground. I felt her claws rip through my jacket as we fell, but I didn't care. I wanted to tear her apart. We rolled over and over, punching and clawing at each other. I tried to use my enhanced strength to pin her down, but she was too quick and dexterous. I managed to hit her in the stomach, but she simply grabbed my arm and threw me across the campground. I slammed into the side of an RV, which sent it rolling. The impact knocked all the wind out of me and left me stunned for a moment. I lay there in pain, unable to move while Irene walked over to me. You should have stayed in your cabin, you pathetic little watcher, she screamed. I rolled onto my back and wiped the blood from my mouth as I watched her approach. I'm going to enjoy ripping you apart, she said. Not if I can help it, I growled. I rose to my knees and let out a defiant roar. I'm going to end you, Irene, I said. She laughed. Do you know how many watchers before you thought that same thing? She taunted. Well, maybe I'll be the first to actually do it, I said. It won't be the last. I've been killing watchers since before you were born, and I'll continue to kill them until my power is absolute, she said. Not today, I promised. I didn't have to wait very long to test my words. Irene charged to me, and with one fluid motion, I grabbed her by the neck and flung her to my right. She smashed into the picnic table. The force of the impact had knocked the entire thing over, spilling food and drinks everywhere. Irene let out a scream of anger and frustration as she scrambled to her feet. She picked up the picnic table and threw it at me. I used my enhanced strength to leap out of the way, but the table splintered and cracked against the side of an RV. I turned to see Irene charging at me once again. I sidestepped her attack and punched her in the stomach. She grunted and doubled over, falling to her knees. I kicked her in the face, sending her crashing backward. Irene got to her feet and charged at me once more, swinging the broken remains of the picnic table around like a weapon. I ducked under it and kicked her in the chest, 
slamming her back into a tree. She fell to the ground, gasping for breath. Irene struggled to get to her feet. You won't kill me. You'll never be able to kill me, she said. I could tell that she was really starting to doubt that. You're wrong, and we both know I can, I said. Irene finally was able to stand back up. She brought the broken remains of the picnic table around like a shield. Well, come on then, watch her. Let's finish this. I lunged forward, my hands outstretched. I slammed them into the wooden railing of the picnic table, shattering it and knocking Irene to the ground. I grabbed her by the throat and lifted her up off the ground. You will pay for everything you've done, every life you've took, I growled. You'll never kill us all, she spat in my face. More of you humans join us every day, she began laughing. I gripped her head and twisted hard. Her neck snapped like a twig, and the red light faded from her eyes. I turned to look at the chaos that was taking place in the campground behind me. I let out a primal, earth-shaking roar, and I tore into the last of Irene's group. My rage was so powerful that the ground shook and trees toppled over. The sound of metal screaming in protest echoed throughout the night as I fought. It was beautiful. I lost track of time as I killed each and every one of them, leaving no survivors. They had made their choice and now they would suffer the consequences. And the carnage was horrible, and I hadn't even reached Hungry Horse yet. I tore the last of the group apart as I reached the town and as I did, the sun finally started to rise, and the residents of Irene's town were already up and about. They were in for a surprise. I started at the diner, tearing the door off the hinges and slaughtering every last resident inside. I stormed through town, destroying anything that got in my way, and I moved quickly and efficiently, tearing through a row of houses, smashing through walls and breaking furniture. The citizens were panicked. They were running everywhere, trying to escape, only to find themselves trapped in the middle of my rampage. I heard the screams and cries of terror as I destroyed the town, and soon it was done. I had slaughtered everyone who had lived there, and I was left standing in the center of a pile of dead residents. It was over. Irene had failed. The people of her town were gone. I grinned and called Dr. Axblood. He would definitely enjoy hearing about this. Good job, Samuel. I heard it was quite the show. I wish I had been there to witness it, Oxblood said. It was incredible. I don't think that I'll ever forget it, I replied. Excellent work. Your work here is done. Go home and take some time to rest and recover. There will be more blood to spill soon enough. These towns aren't the only weird things about national parks, Oxblood said. Understood. I'll contact you when I need you again, Oxblood had added. I hung up the phone and I closed my eyes. What was next? I couldn't wait to find out. But for now, it was good to know that Yellowstone was in safe hands. Thank you to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this week's podcast. You guys may have heard me talking about VPNs in the past because honestly, it's pretty important stuff. I may be Mr. Creeps, but there are some real world creeps out there that want to spy on you and gather your data. And that's why you need to be using ExpressVPN. Every time that you connect to an unencrypted network, in cafes, hotels, airports, basically any network that's not your own, your online data is not secured. Any hacker on the same network can gain access to and steal your personal data, your passwords, financial details, you name it. The way ExpressVPN protects you is by creating a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet so that hackers can't steal your data. Hackers can make some serious money selling personal information on the dark web, but ExpressVPN has made it easier than ever to keep your information safe. Just fire up the app, click one button, and you're instantly protected. And ExpressVPN works on all your devices, like laptops, phones, and tablets, 
so you can stay secure on the go. Secure your online data today at expressvpn.com slash mrcreeps and get three extra free months. That's expressvpn.com slash mrcreeps. expressvpn.com slash mrcreeps.